to the complexity of no choice. People are always like, does no choice mean that we just kind of are automatons or this or that? Not really, no. What no choice means is that there are built-in timings to things. And as Ra liked to say, and um, my good friend James Alexander quotes, no choice doesn't mean no chance. Ooh. And I always like that as a reminder. Like, you have a chance to make it work. You have a chance to learn. You have a chance to, to develop. So I was at a place where my awareness was saying, I'm ready for a change. But the, that awareness is not enough to make the change happen. That awareness can essentially just now prepare you to notice when there is a response to something, mm -hmm. to notice when something does come into your life that gives you the opportunity, the sort of window to experience something. Welcome to Whole and Unleashed, a podcast about coming home to ourselves. I'm your host, Jessica Locke, a holistic mindset, strala yoga, and human design guide. This podcast is not about telling you what to do. It's about sharing stories and tools to connect to your inner wisdom and maybe give you an extra nudge towards living wholeheartedly. Because deep down, only you know what's best for you. We'll be talking mindset, business, recovering from burnout, human design, transitions, and so much more. Let's dive in, shall we? Hi, welcome, welcome. Jonah, thank you so much for joining me today. And Jonah is a 5-1 sacred generator with a left angle cross of healing, a human design educator, organizer of many community events and projects. And I know you're currently planning for the fourth High Desert Human Design Conference and also running an online course called the Objective Personality System. So I'm excited. Welcome. <laughs> Thank you so much, Jess. And you're you're speaking at the High Desert Human Design <laughs> Conference, which I'm really excited about. And I know others are as well. We've oh my gosh, been you're... finalizing the schedule. Uh, I know you have a main stage talk and then a workshop as well. And so really excited. I'm so grateful. I'm so grateful. But you know, before we get into the details of the conference, tell us a little bit about yourself. <laughs> I know that's a big question. <laughs> Who are no, you? No, I'm, I'm happy to what tell a little do? background. Um, yeah, I got into human design in 20. 15. I was introduced to it in 2006. And so it was about nine years between the time that I found it and the time it actually got through to me. And uh, I always kind of explain this to people that, you know, um, it really has to get in. And I think, you know, any of us who are really learning human design and into it will agree that it's like a logic virus. And just like you might catch a cold when your defenses are down or you're kind of, you know, emotionally distraught, it was actually not until September 12th, 2015, that I was at a real low point in my life and having so many problems. And I met someone who gave me a human design reading. And for whatever reason, my defenses were down. I caught the logic virus and I could not get rid of it. I did not, I was mad. I did not want to get into human design. I did oh. not want to, um, you know, I wasn't looking for it. I mean, I, I was not, I didn't want to like have it take over my life in the way it did. Of course, now I am relieved and glad that it did. But, uh, but you know, at the, at the time it was kind of like, okay, I'm done here. And then like two weeks later, it'd be like, no, I'm not done. I'm not done. I'm not done. There's something and, um, there. So yeah, so for me, like part of my background was basically, before getting really into human design, which now I'm a human design educator and I throw this event and it's pretty much a huge part of my life. Um, I, I was always into mysticism. I was into psychology. Carl Jung was one of my main points of, of interest was the, the work of Jung. In high school, Jung kind of saved me. I really was having a hard time and reading the work of Carl Jung spoke to my soul in a very deep way and uh, gave me sort of food for the soul in a way that you know other things didn't so reading his work um, moving on from Jung into various mystical studies uh, I used to actually lecture on Jung I'd be a guest lecturer and I would also lecture on alchemy which is something that Jung popularized the study of in our modern era you know before him people kind of just thought of you know alchemists as pre-scientific people who didn't really know anything and Jung really legitimated um, the psychological approach to interpreting alchemy. So so all through my 20s, you know, I, I've my, as I said in 2006, let's see, I was 22 years old, when I first encountered human design, I wasn't ready There wasn't for human that, design. that much information either. Yeah, and the information I was getting was just like, I didn't take it very seriously because I thought that I was a serious student of the mystical arts and I kind of put human design in a bucket with 
other kind of practices that weren't as serious. Now I know that, you know, um, I'm a gate 46 personality son and my seriousness, I can get really stuck in seriousness. And actually I, I need to, uh, to learn to see a little more of the, um, the, the ecstatic aspects of life. But, uh, but, you know, at that point, I was just a very serious, studious person. I was also a, a computer scientist. I worked at Amazon for a number of years, and then I also made my own startups. And so I kind of came from this tech background. I lived in Seattle um, for most of my life. I was born in Boston, lived in Seattle from the age of nine. And, um, and then now I live in Santa Fe, New Mexico. And so just kind of watching my life path and seeing the role of really beginning to follow strategy and authority. And that was when it all started. And that was not until, until 2015. Uh, so it is possible to read human design, learn human design, have all the information, but it somehow doesn't get in. And it's like, it's only when it actually sticks and the strategy and authority actually kind of takes over. And then you start to look around and go, wow, um, my life is so different. You know, my life is just so different from this. I never thought I would leave a big city to live in a small town like Santa Fe. I never thought I would leave a tech job to be a teacher of something, even though I was always teaching during that time. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's, I, we, we get to be surprised. We get to be surprised by life. And that's it. My life has taken a lot of surprising turns. So yeah, I'm just giving you my background kind of came from Seattle tech world, considered myself a computer scientist, considered myself very academic, um, taught and studied philosophy and psychology, as well as more mystical things, but was always a little bit snobby about about mysticism, right? It was always a little bit kind of, you know, elitist about it. Like, oh, no, no, I, I'm an academic. And, and now I, it is, I look at that and laugh because, I mean, if I would have found human design and actually got into it years earlier, think of what would have happened. But there is kind of a divine timing. I wasn't yeah. ready at age 22. I, it had to be nine years later when I was 31. That's, that's when I was ready to enter into it. So oh, yeah. yeah, that kind of sets the, sets the timeline for my life. And so that was about <laughs> now it's, you know, yeah, 2015 is really when I, when, when it took over, I, I guess you could say. It's not even I got into it. It's like it got into me, literally. Right. So. right. What about human design or learning about your design that kept you wanting to learn more? Because it's it's so easy to be like, how can our birth date determine or yeah, yeah right, right. There, 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 there are barriers right? to entry. There are definitely yeah, barriers to yeah. entry. I, you know what I've realized is um, over the years that the way you get into human design is really unique to you and that the way you decondition is almost like your incarnation cross is a roadmap for deconditioning mm -hmm. because if the incarnation cross is ultimately about your life purpose, then to get to your purpose, you have to go through this whole journey. And I'm on the cross of healing. And so what I learned was that for me personally, but I've heard this from other cross of healing people as well, part of their journey is burning out and getting sick and sort of going into a recuperation mode. And if you look at the four gates of the cross, it's like gate 46, getting more in touch with my body, gate 25, having integrity and needing to have that sort of purifying phase, 52, needing to go into a lot of stillness and rest, and 58, needing to find the joy in in life and you know you can't heal if if you're you don't have joy you can't mm -hmm. heal if you don't rest you can't heal if you don't have that 25 innocence integrity not letting yourself be corrupted and and ultimately if you hate your body if you wish that you were someone else and if you don't have that self-love of the body or or you know kind of body love and so for me my incarnation cross trajectory was i got really sick and mm -hmm. i had to completely disconnect from my old life and go into the themes of those gates. I didn't really realize it at the time. The other thing I would say is that in terms of the barriers to entry and, and getting interested in human design, yeah, for some scientific minded people, the timing would be a barrier of entry. For me, I was so deep in Jung's theory of synchronicity that I just explained it as sort of an acausal connectedness. And I didn't really need causality at that point. Uh, even if there are causal mechanisms, I was sort of satisfied with saying this is part of the divine timing of the cosmic clock. So that wasn't it for me. But I did notice that, um, and I have noticed that people will essentially get into one aspect of human design 
and there will be particular barriers depending on their base. And I, I don't know how deep we want to go into this, but just the point is that base is a very interesting, nuanced part of this, the study of human design in that base is a very deep aspect of your design. Like we have gate activations, lines, we have colors, which gives us our PHS, dietary regimen, all these things, tones, which gives us our cognition and sense. And you keep going and you get to base. And base is the only thing that never changes lifetime after lifetime after lifetime. The rest of the body graph, you, you reincarnate, you know, you're a projector, you're a manifester, you're a generator. Um, base is always the same and so it's very limiting in that way it's like the core limitation the core perspective and i happen to be base two there are five bases total my base is all about role and purpose and ultimately appears in other areas of human design as profile so i didn't realize it at the time but the one thing that sold me on human design was profile mm -hmm. i started to see that profile was so undeniable you know, I'm a five one. I started to see the role of the fifth line. I could look at somebody, they're a one three, and I could see that they're so deep in their investigations or the second line and they're a natural and I could see their natural talents and their blind spots and things like that. And so for me, learning profile was such an incredible entry point into human design. And I suspect it will be for around 20% of the people out there, the other base twos. But what I've noticed is that the other bases have different entry points. And in fact, one of the bases, base four, it probably um, can't even really, I mean, I, I don't want to say anything limiting here, but these are limitations. Probably mm -hmm. it is correct for a base four person to only learn human design insofar as they are able to modify it and use their own language. And I know mm -hmm. this annoys a lot of people in human design because they're like, well, why does somebody have to make gene keys? Why does somebody have to make their mm -hmm. own version? And I'm like, they're just based for, you know, <laughs> like it's just let them be based for. I actually don't know what, what base they are, but um, the people that have done these things. But yeah. in general, like base four is all about making your own system, designing your own world using your own vocabulary. Ra himself was based for. I like to remind people that if you brought human design to Ra, he would yeah. have no interest in it. He had to make it. He so, make it I mean, own. so at, so at the extreme, like your base is really telling you how it's correct for you to even enter into human design. And someone like me, I'm very much entering it from the perspective of roles we all have roles to play mm -hmm. for the other four bases that's not going to really click for them as much they're going to be like oh yeah of course you have a role that's not a big deal that's just some other thing out there but they're going to have their own kind of way that human design is important to them right that i've never heard about that before do you mind like expanding on the other bases or we can also yeah yeah research? absolutely and so that and, and that way if there are you know viewers or you know listeners who want to look at their own bases they could they could do this so yeah. first of all to find your base you're going to need um you know an advanced view like on maya mechanics or mm -hmm. on neutrino design that's an app that will show you um, some of them well humanarchetypes.com is a free one it doesn't require any subscription and that will tell you your base and you also have to have a fairly precise birth time because the um, sun earth base does change every seven and a half minutes and so it's nice to check you know if you were born in the last 30 seconds of your base check mm -hmm. the next base too just to kind of see which one fits more for you um, so starting with the first base base one you know Ross said that bases one three and five have an easier time getting into human design and bases two and four have a more difficult time. And we can see why when we go through them. Base one is the base of movement. And it's essentially a very non-hierarchical base. They don't really like the idea of hierarchies. Like I have a good friend who's base one. I'm base two. I'm very hierarchical. I will say, you know, roles. We all have roles to play. Some of our roles is to be part of the mutative core, the avant-garde, the vanguard of humanity, the cutting edge of human consciousness. And he'll say, well, isn't everybody at the cutting edge of their own evolution? Isn't everybody at the center of their own mutation? Like he doesn't like this idea that there's like a hierarchy from top to bottom. For him, it's kind of like everyone is at the middle of their hierarchy. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So base one is very much anti-hierarchical. Um, it, I mean, I could, we could talk for hours about each one, so I'll just kind of talk about how they might get into human design. Base one is very into unexplored horizons. It's actually hard to be a base one person in, now because in the old days, base one could literally go to a new horizon. These were the, 
the the diasporas, the first diaspora out of Africa, for instance. These are the 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 kind of people who went to the farthest horizon and went past it and mm -hmm. went past the farthest horizon. And part of the keynotes of base one is I define, which is naming a place. So these are the ones who would name the place, mm -hmm. but they wouldn't actually want to live there. They'd want to keep going. So a lot of base one people now, because the world has been explored, they're exploring the mental realms. They're exploring new weird genres of music. I mean, um, my base one friend, Mike, when I first met him, he was listening to some very bizarre music. He worked at a bookshop and it sounded like cars, engines revving and car doors slamming and like weird, like Enya synthesizers with a Japanese man talking in a deep voice. And I said, what is this? And he said, oh, it's car commercials from the early nineties in Japan. Like that was his genre. Like that's what he yeah. likes to listen to just to chill out, you know? Yeah. So base one is kind of like exploring niches nobody else had explored. You know, he mm -hmm. was vaporwave five years before vaporwave became a genre. He was, these base one people are always kind of pushing the horizon. So I think they get into human design early on. They're the early adopters. They now, if they're based one getting into it, you're probably kind of like wanting to go to the farthest horizon of human design. You're probably kind of like, this is boring. This stuff that people have already figured out and already kind of worked everything out. Like, let's go to some weird niche. Let's go to some weird, obscure place in it. But I think it's easier for them to get into than some of the other bases because they're already open to something different. They're already open to, okay, what else is there? We've already, you know, it's the base of movement. So they want to just kind of move and just keep going and keep, keep exploring. Base two, Ross said, is one of the hardest bases to get into human design because it's the principle of mind. And so mm -hmm. each of these bases have certain keynotes where you can kind of tell somebody's really living their design based on particular keynotes. So base one, they're, they're really living their design if they're sort of how they move in the world, like even physically how they move, how their mind moves, how their body moves, how their emotions move, um, how they explore new things and how they discover new things and stuff like that. That's one of the, these are the signposts. For base two, you can tell they're really living their design because they have an encyclopedic brilliant mind. Mm -hmm. So as a base two person myself, if you're like, wow, Jonah has this incredible mind, like he's just like a giant head walking around on a little stick person body, then you know, then I'm, it's working, you know, <laughs> then, then human design is working for me, which is also funny if somebody says, you know, design's not mental, you're so mental, Jonah. I'm like, I'm base two, okay, give me a break here. Like I'm here to be yeah. the mind of, of the world, to play my part in contributing to the mind of the world. It's very hard for base two people to get into human design because the mind is so incompatible with the movement. If you look at the way the bases are laid out, they're exactly opposite. And you have the mind in one corner, movement, base one in the other. Then you have the body and the design between them, which is kind of like the unconscious. And strategy and authority is actually mapped into the base mat, as we call it, the mat of the base, mm -hmm. in the sense that the mind has no direct access to the movement of the life force energy itself. It has to either go through the body because the body has direct access to the movement or go through the unconscious because the unconscious has the direct access to the movement. So literally following strategy and authority is your mind accessing your body and your unconscious because wow. they are in touch with the movement of life. How cool is that, right? That like it's just literally gave me right chills. there. Oh. No, no, I love it, right? I, I love that like Ra didn't invent strategy and authority. He just like named it because Package of this, this sort of, yeah, he packaged it up a little bit because of this information. So as a base two person, very hard for me to get into human design. It took me nine years. You know, I found out about it. I'm like, as a big mind, I'm like, okay, I will file that away in one of my boxes and then just keep going. The other reason it's hard is because a lot of people get into human design because they're really having a hard time in life and they're not fulfilling their life purpose. They feel unfulfilled. They're feeling like they've reached various dead ends or they're feeling like they're hurting or being hurt by people or just in different bad situations where something is happening that needs to change. Mm -hmm. Well, base two, being the principle of mind, gets along very well in the world. So I did not and still do not relate to a lot of the not self descriptions mm -hmm. of the pain and suffering. And I see that the pain and suffering is out there. But personally speaking, I was very successful in the Maya, very happy, content with satisfying, positive relationships, 
you know, I didn't have a lot of the quote unquote problems. It really wasn't until my early thirties and I did actually reach a sort of low point in my life that I was able to get into it. But a lot of base two people are doing so well, quote unquote, that they don't really look for a, for a problem or for, you know, they don't see human design as a solution because it's like, what problem is it solving? I already have a happy relationship. I have a good job. I'm healthy. I'm this, I'm that. It really wasn't until uh, I got into, into human design or I started to kind of have a negative time. And then when I got into it, that's when I actually got really sick because I actually started to make different decisions that led me to, that led all the health issues to surface, I guess you right. could say. So it was you know, like right? a it's detox. almost like they were all suppressed or they were, yeah, they were pushed down. So base two people, it can be very hard to get into human design because we are very mental people. The thing to realize is just the, the proper place for the mind. And, you know, base two understands roles. So, you know, again, what is the role of the mind? If you understand what the role of the mind is, then you can, then you can realize it's okay to have a lot of awareness and learning and knowledge and all of these things. But, you know, the role of the mind is ultimately to be a repository of memory and to be mm -hmm. able to access memory. And that is different than being in touch with the movement of life, which is always happening now and is not part of the past memory. Base three people, um, this is a principle of the body and they can get into human design oftentimes through somatic practices or through really getting in touch with how the body knows. It's almost like the body's wisdom, the body's intelligence. Um, they can really notice that their body always kind of had the right answer for them and they were just trying to help somebody else or trying to you know, live for somebody else and that if they just trust their body, it will it will guide them more. So I think the, the body side gives them a little more insight into how human design works. Base four is probably the single hardest base to get into it. This is the base of ego and also the base of the unconscious. And Ra himself was base four. And the reason it's so difficult is because base four is here to design their own system. Mm -hmm. It's literally the principle of design. So base four people, they made our schools and they made our prisons, interestingly, and they designed, you know, stoplights and they designed, uh, vote. they designed like maybe like voting and taxing and all these government processes. They designed hospitals, like they designed the services of the world. There's actually a field called service designer. Mm -hmm. And these are people who don't do any visual design at all. They designed something like Netflix. It's a subscription and you pay and here's what you get. They literally are designing the services and they do it so well, people just take it for granted that that service has already existed. We don't realize that every single service out there, I mean, cooking was probably invented by a base four person. They're like, this is a service. We are going to take something, the raw materials and combine them into a product. Like, how do we do that? So, so the productization, the service design, the systems design, all of this is base four stuff. And that's why I tell base four people, it's okay that you're having a hard time with human design, it's because you're not here to take somebody else's ready-made words, but come up with your own words, come up with your own system, come up with your own understanding of it. I mean, make your own version of this, which I know people get annoyed with. They're kind of like, why do we need another version of this? Well, 20% of the people out there aren't here to pick up something somebody else made. They're here to, to make their own version of it. Uh, I have a good friend who's base four and every year he has like a season that he's done with human design. And that's his season where he's like, Jonah, I'm, I'm done. I'm not doing any more human design. I've reached the end and I'm like, okay, I'll talk to you in three months. And he's like, all right, I'm back. Uh, so, you know, it's just, he has his seasonal hiatus from human design, but it's because ultimately Ra would not have been interested in human design. Ra wouldn't have been like, if you brought human design to Ra, he would have been like, great, enjoy. I'm going to do my own thing. Like, yeah. it's not the, these aren't the people that are there to, to do that. And then, uh, but we need them. We need them in human design because they're also the, in, what, what they contribute to the totality, and here's me again looking at it from the role perspective, yeah. what is their role? Um, their role is to have a backbone and to really stand up for people mm -hmm. and to stand up for themselves, which then inspires others to stand up. Like basically, if we didn't have any base four people in the world, nobody would really stand up for anything. We'd all just kind of go along with things. And right. then we, I'm not we, going along with this. I'm not, yeah. I'm not going along with human design because some guy told me I need to do this. Like, yeah. come on, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to find my own way. So... Yeah. So they're the ones that really challenge a lot of the kind of fundamental assumptions of human design, come up with their own versions of it, come up with their right. own modifications. 
And then finally, base five. And base five is the principle of the personality. And, uh, and their real keynote is, or their sort of signpost, I guess you could say, for living their design is if they have such a strong personality, almost in the sense of a radio personality or a, you know, a, they, they, they are unforgettable. And, and most base five people who are not really living their design or haven't fully stepped into their life purpose, you might have a hard time remembering if they were at the party. You might have a hard time remembering, like there are base five people that you meet over and over again. You can't remember their name. You're kind of like, do I know you from somewhere? Like there's just this sort of blending in with the space of the world because it's the principle of, of space. And so they sort of blend in with the atmosphere. But then when they are living their design, they become these strong personalities that we even fantasize about. It's the principle mm -hmm. of fantasy. And they really exemplify a certain type, like the strong silent type or the girl next door type or the rock star type or the bombshell type or this or that. They kind of become archetypal. They actually sort of channel an archetypal energy. And uh, and, and they can get into to human design, I think, through just realizing the archetypal energies and archetypes of almost like the gods that speak through these channels and these activations and things like that. So they sort of get into it by embodying those archetypes in a way. Like they, they kind of really like, they can learn about, oh, I'm a projector. Then they can really embody the archetype of the guide. And then they can like be the, almost like the guide from Star Wars or from, yeah. from, from, you know, Lord of the Rings or, or, or any of these great fantasy kind of things where they captivate our imagination, they captivate our fantasy, and they sort of play up the archetypal roles. Like the base five isn't going to just, you know, be a guide in a t-shirt. They're going to be a guide with the robes and the, yeah. you know, regalia, because that's going to really capture people's imagination and fantasy and so that's kind of how they can they can embody the archetypes in in human design more so yeah I, I mean base is such a deep thing i mean i guess just to kind of summarize like this is bigger than any one lifetime like base is literally something that we do in every life as part of our contribution to the totality and there really are these five pillars to what kind of needs to happen and if any one of the bases were just to vanish everything right. would fall apart like these are like such essential parts of how the Maya, as we call it, is made up. You know, yeah, these are yeah. the, the the fundamental constituents of the Maya. Ooh, I love this. Like, I feel like human design, there's so many layers. I would call them infinite layers that people have found like different doors and entryways. And at the end of it all, it's like, this is about embracing your difference. What makes you different? And you are so needed because we do need sometimes once in a while, someone's entry point is a different set of language. Someone's entry point is being br broken open and be like, nothing works. So let's see if this yeah. thing will work. So I love, thank you so much for taking the time to break this down. That was so entertaining. I can listen to you talk for hours. <laughs> well, that's, I am, I am honored. It's, I, I take no credit for it. It's gate 12. You know, I was lucky to have gate 12 in this life. I probably had a number of lifetimes without gate 12 and I was like waiting patiently. When can I finally articulate this? You know, right. but I have the gate of articulation, which I feel very lucky to have. Mm. Tell me a little bit more about how you, why did you decide to move to Santa Fe and then start the human, the center for human design as well? That little community yeah. that has grown. I mean, absolutely. I mean, why do we decide to do anything? This is like, it's almost like it's, it's harder and harder and harder to say why we make the decision. Mm -hmm. But I ultimately do make a distinction between the mechanics of decision making and the mechanical level, all the mechanical things that happen, your channels, um, your you know electromagnetics with people, your centers, your type, that's all mechanical versus the awareness. And the mm -hmm. awareness is really what we call the wisdom in human design, where the wisdom emerges in the openness. That's the awareness and that's the learning. And so it's kind of funny because they kind of play off each other in that the awareness can have an idea or a thought or a reason or even a feeling in some some ways. I mean, there can be bodily feelings, but there can also be like a, you know, sort of, and I'm aware that I'm now feeling fed up with this. I'm aware that I'm now feeling exhausted by this. And then the the awareness tries to figure out what to do. And so, you know, I was aware that I needed a change. I was aware that I wasn't feeling great where I was and things like that. And yet the awareness can't make the change happen. That's the mm -hmm. mental initiating. That's like, just do it, just make it happen. Quit your job, break up, yeah. you know. It's so funny how much permission we seem to want to just 
you know, initiate and use the mind to, to change everything. And what ends up happening is there's this law of the Maya where the Maya is going to give you a particular amount of time, like in a relationship, say, and if you break up earlier before that time's done, you just kind of reset it and then go back to a new, another relationship, which gives you the same lesson and yeah. then starts over. And then you're given like the, another, the same thing two years again, and then you're like feeling the same thing. And then if you stick it through, you kind of get to see what's next. But that's really the, the conundrum is that there really is no escape from the timing of the Maya. But we do obviously make decisions and have choices. This is some of the complexity of no choice. People are always like, does no choice mean that we just kind of are automatons or this or that? Yeah. Not really, no. What no choice means is that there are built-in timings to things. And as Ra like to say, and um, my good friend James Alexander quotes, no choice doesn't mean no chance. Ooh. And I always like that as a reminder. Like, you have a chance to make it work. You have a chance to learn. You have a chance to to develop. So I was at a place where my awareness was saying, I'm ready for a change. But the that awareness is not enough to make the change happen. That awareness can essentially just now prepare you to notice when there is a response to something, mm -hmm. to notice when something does come into your life that gives you the opportunity, the sort of window to experience something different. And so what I was noticing was that I was not feeling very satisfied. I'm a generator. I'm here to be satisfied. I was noticing a lot of frustration. Interestingly enough, um, I was able to move to Santa Fe in 2017, but I wasn't able to actually leave my job until last year, six years later, 2023. So essentially, you know, there's, there are lag times. There are, there are real lag, I guess it was, was it maybe 2018 to 2023. But anyway, um, you know, I was aware that I would eventually leave my job. What ended up happening was that the, the circumstances kind of were out of my control and the job just ended itself. Mm -hmm. And that was something that I almost had to remain committed to seeing it through to the end because if I would have preemptively left my job, I would have just had to get another job. But weirdly, by like putting up with an extra five years of being like, well, I guess I just got to wait to respond, you know, <laughs> like that's what I kind of reminded myself like, well, I guess, you know, quitting is a form of initiating, you know, leaving is initiating. It's like me trying to make life hurry up, me right. trying to make things go faster. So what ended up happening was um, during that time, I stayed at the job and I just continued to learn and teach human design. And I, I put on the first Thai Desert Human Design Conference while I still had a 40 hour a week full time tech job. So it was a lot of kind of Juggling. living in two worlds. And I, I am convinced that if I would have preemptively quit the job, it's not like you initiate and everything falls apart. You just initiate and you end up out of the frying pan into the fire. I would have just taken another job. Like, it's not right. like anything so bad would have happened. People are always like, what happens if you initiate? What happens if you go against yeah, your design? Yeah. Nothing really. You just kind of, you just get you exhausted. Just flail about. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You just flail a bit. Yeah. You just end up in the same place you were anyway. Like it's not right. like anything, it's not like anything really bad happens. You just kind right. of end up not, it's like, there's just no point in doing it. There's no reason to do it because, oh, I broke up with that person. Well, I just ended up in another relationship and it's, I'm learning the same thing and going through the yeah. same, the same challenges. So for me, you know, I did have an awareness that Seattle was not the right place for me, that I'd kind of lived out the end of my life there. The shelf life of Seattle had kind of reached its end. And I started to realize that pretty early on in the experiment and also noticing that I felt really good in high elevation. And then later I learned I was mountains environment. After I thought back to, wow, you know, I actually don't really like living in the city that much, hustle bustle, middle of it all. I'm a, I'm a landscape person, you know, I kind of like, I'm on a dirt road here. There's a, my neighbors have horses. My yeah. neighbors have sheep and horses. Like, it's kind of nice. And, and so I was noticing that every year in Seattle, I would go on this annual um, camping trip up to the mountains. And I always feel amazing. I would wake up just like crisp mountain air and just feeling like so good and so alive. So then I started with my awareness researching places that 
are high elevation. And here's the funny thing. People might say, well, Jonah, why did you even need to look at those places? If you're really just living your life, you'll just respond to them. I'm like, I'm cultivating my awareness. So I am aware of what the options are. Like I wasn't making a decision. Like th th we have to distinguish here. There can be people who are such extremists in human design that they oh think gosh. like researching places to live online is like initiating. I'm like, no, no, no. I, I waited. You're I waited working to respond. with yeah. your mind. I think it's so important. Yeah, I'm learning. Like, because we have a word awareness and we need to work with the awareness instead of like the awareness is here to learn and we we yes. have a chance to learn and so when people say that no choice means that it doesn't really matter you're either going to do it or you're not and they just surrender to that i'm like okay yeah surrender to the hand you've been dealt surrender yeah. to the way the cookie crumbles surrender to what life has given you you know that's surrender surrender to like we can't i can change my haircut but i can't you know grow back my hair or something like that like surrender to like what we what we have you know what i mean yeah. um but that's just radical self-acceptance and self-love when it actually comes to like what is the mind for it's here to learn yeah. obviously it's here to learn it's here to gain awareness about things that's what we that's that's what learning is so so I was learning so much about like, wow, where, where are these high elevation places? And I was looking at like Mexico City and like, wow, that looks really cool, 10,000 feet. But it's a big city and there's all this pollution. I don't know if I'd like that. And yeah. looking at Denver and I was kind of like, I know people in Denver. That's cool. They have a good music scene. And then I was, you know, Boulder. Okay, a lot of mystical people. And then I looked at Santa Fe and I was like, margaritas. <laughs> nachos enchiladas like this is like my kind of place i'm like i have always loved new mexican food i didn't really realize it was new mexican i like it like i've always and then i was kind of like wow this architecture like i love spain i love europe i have i, yeah. I go you know and i'm like this is like the most european looking city this is incredible and it's at seven thousand feet like how have i not heard of this place like i thought santa fe was in california like i didn't even know you know i was like still like out of had to. <laughs> no i mean well people do it's like because we just hear santa fe we're like i think i've heard of that place like it has there's like a song about it like i don't know but but anyway and then i was kind of like wow i would love to visit there and then what ended up happening was i was going to the united astrological conference in chicago and that was fully through sacral response I had been dating an astrologer in Seattle who took me to Norwalk. was like, hey, you want to go to this conference? Like, uh-huh. Like, let's go. Like, yeah. I was really into it. And then like, and then, oh my God, have you heard about UAC? Like this whole astrological conference was like, like I was like sacrally off the, the charts for that. Yeah, yeah. And so then I was, I was going and I had a friend that I'd met at the Northwest Astrological Conference. And I mentioned to her just because again, like with awareness, you can mention, like you yeah. can be like, hey, I heard this movie's good. Do you want to see it? And they're like, uh-huh. They're a generator, yeah. you know? And then they're like, do you want to see it? Uh-huh. Like you can, you can do that. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, I was like, do you want to go to Santa Fe? And she was like, uh-huh, let's go to Santa Fe. And then I was like, really? And she's like, yeah, do you want to go? And I'm like, uh-huh, I want to check out Santa Fe. Like, let's, like, let's, let's feel so we went on this excitement. little adventure. Total adventure. And I spent two weeks in Santa Fe and we're both very independent people. I'm single definition, you know, so we kind of like went our own way. We're both, we were both five ones. I basically went by myself because like, I took the plane with her. We ended up getting a and b together, separate rooms out of Aura. Best decision I ever made in my life, sleeping out of Aura, by the way. And uh, I haven't, I've not slept in Aura like for years and it's been amazing. But um, but anyway, she just like wanted to go take photos and she had friends who were photographers and all this stuff. And I kind of went off by myself. And except for a couple days that we did a couple things together, like road trips, I was mostly just deep in this experiment of like, okay, let's just not initiate, I'm going to call a bunch of places to look at, or I'm going to do anything. Let's just like be in the flow of life. Mm -hmm. So the first day I'm in Santa Fe, we, we got in late at night. So this is like the, the, the second day, I guess. But the first morning, I just take an Uber and I go to a cafe and I just am like, I'm just going to wait. And this is the power of waiting. Like generators say so much with our aura. And uh, oh yeah, that's the first cafe I go to. Um, you know, I'm really practicing having rapport with people at that time and not just initiating me like, hi, I'm new here. What do I do? Or something like that. You know, that would be kind of like the fingernails on the chalkboard of the generator. So instead, I'm just kind of hanging out and then like, hey, I haven't seen you around here. Like someone starts talking to me, the barista. And then I'm like, hey, is there a good place? At that point, I smoked cigarettes. I don't actually. Once I moved to high elevation, no longer needed the oxygen reduction, but I just kind of naturally quit. You <laughs> oh know, I have an undefined gosh. ego, so I tried to quit so many times. Never happened. It's almost like you anyway, so to replicate that scenario. I, well, well, yeah, that's what, that was a Raj joke. And I, I don't know. I mean, it might, there may be some truth to it. He would always joke like, oh, these mountains people, they're always trying to get lower oxygen. And so anyway, at, at that point, I smoked and I said, 
is there a good place to smoke a cigarette? And she goes, oh, let me show you. And, you know, so, I mean, you could argue that's initiating. Not really. If you're in rapport with somebody, it's yeah. just a conversation. So then she shows me a place to smoke and we start talking and she's like, you know, you should go here and here. And I'm like, cool. So then I go, to, it's like, it's like being a detective. You're like an investigator, like trying to find where the life force is. Mm -hmm. I also have a defined G. So I'm a little bit like a bloodhound on the scent of like, I know this town has some life force energy. Like, let's yeah. find it. I know this town is alive, you know? So then I go to this next cafe she tells me and uh, I walk in I kind of do the same thing and I'm hanging out there's not a lot of rapport but there's a little bit of like I ended up actually becoming good friends with with the uh, uh, barista working but I eventually say like um you know after just hanging out for a minute I'm there for like half an hour or something and then like we kind of there, there becomes a moment like you just wait for the right moment to say something yeah. part of the wisdom of the undefined throat right and then I go um hey is there any like um cool underground art venue diy music anything here like i'm just i'm like visiting and i'm just trying to find like very casual very like low ball like like or not low ball but you know, you know what i mean like softball softball i'm like <laughs> anything going on and then she just goes sorry no and i'm like okay fine so i go sit down and i have a book and then like half an hour later she comes over she's like gives me a piece of paper she's like okay tonight there's a warehouse on the south end and there's a really cool art party going on and i'm sorry i didn't say it i just like didn't know you but you should go and i'm like okay cool <laughs> you know and so then i'm like yes i have my next clue it's like finding yeah. a clue you know yeah, this yeah. is also probably just how my defined g works because if i were an undefined g i would just like sit there and people would be like kind of drawn to me but instead i have to like hunt a little bit you know? yeah, yeah. so <laughs> that's a defined g so anyway this is this is my first day literally my first day so then i go to this place ghost is what it's called it's like an avant-garde they have like noise shows and like underground diy art space at a warehouse yeah. and it said byob so i bring a six pack of beer i get there right at right on time but of course on time is early mm -hmm. so i'm there on time and i'm sitting out front and there's nobody there and uh the people inside are setting up a little bit, but they're kind of like, I'm like too early. And a guy walks up and he goes, I just want to thank you so much for what you do. And I was like, hmm, okay, weird. And then he kind of goes in. And then a minute later, early a few minutes later, I'm talking to him and he comes back out and he's like, you know, what you've done for this town is just so great. And I said, who do you think I am? And he goes, good one. And I'm like, what is this guy thinking? Like, he thinks I'm like joking with him. I, I later find out that he thought that I was running the place, which oh. like energetically is kind of like, I guess I do belong here. Like if you show right. up somewhere and people are kind of like, now Ra did say, if you look like you belong somewhere, you probably don't. But I, I think he meant more in like the, the negative sense of like, if yeah. you look like yeah. you're part of the furniture. But this guy like thought I was in charge of it. And I talked to him later, I was like, so I really think, like, I'm really not joking. I just arrived. Um, did you think I was like, ago? He's like, really? I I could have sworn. And like, the thing is, the place is run by a woman. It's not even like I looked like some person. <laughs> right. I just like had an energy of running. And he's like, I swear, I thought I saw you before. And I just kind of, I'm so sorry. I thought that you ran this whole thing. And I'm like, no, but you want a beer? And so anyway, so then I get to meet people. And it's just like pretty soon I had like, I don't know, I met people that day that are still my friends to this day. And that's kind of the thing I, I remembered later Years later, I read about when Ra first went to Ibiza and the first place he went in Ibiza, he met a group of people who were friends who were at his funeral. They literally were his friends from within a couple hours of showing up in Ibiza till his death. So it's almost like when you are aligned with the right place, you pretty much just fall into i mean you know granted he has a defined g i have a defined g like he found the right place but even yeah. with an undefined g you show up and they find you yeah. and they discover you and they pull you in and these these are your friends like that's no choice <laughs> i didn't get to choose my friends i just show up and it's like oh these are my new friends i guess i guess we're friends now what i ended up happening was someone told me about this interactive art collective meow wolf they were having an event yeah her I boyfriend was coffee. djing there yeah it's a really cool spot you got to check it out while you're here her boyfriend was djing so she got me free tickets at, they had an after party with all the musicians suddenly it's 4 a.m and i'm having conversations about astrology and whimsical you know yeah. thing. i'm like this is a this is the mountains environment this is mountains oh. like i you know i started the day at 6 a.m and now it's 4 a.m and i'm like still in this energize high with your sacral energy just yeah buzzing. yeah it was total flow and then i slept for a day after yes yeah. that's, that's yeah. how that went you know but um you know i i'm, I'm a 29 46 too i mean things end up in a in a flow and the flow yeah. just kind of dovetails one to the next yeah. and um and that's the the sacral response is that 
I wasn't like, hey, do you want to go to Meow Wolf? I've heard of that. I was just kind of like at the event. And then she goes, by the way, my boyfriend's playing at Meow Wolf. It's like a few blocks away. You want to check it out? I'm like, uh -huh, let's check it out. And then we go over to Meow Wolf. And then it's like, we're having an after party. You guys want to go? I'm like, you kidding me? Let's go. Like we just kind of, just kind of one thing led to the next. And, uh, and it was just a very organic thing. And I'm, I'm still friends with those people. I mean, I still see them around. I, I saw them last week. I mean, you just kind of end up in a place where there's all these signposts telling you this is the right place for you. Yeah. So after that, I, that was in June and it was right after the UAC conference. And I was kind of like, okay, I'm moving here. And I moved there October 1st. So I had a three month window after yeah. having lived in Seattle for 25 years, wow. I just got rid of all my stuff. I'm an undefined spleen. So it was kind of scary. Yeah, I didn't get rid yeah. of everything. I moved some stuff. Yeah. And, yeah. Yeah. Um, and I, you know, I, and I found a really good place pretty much, um, you know, I, I'm not a fourth line, so I wasn't able to really tap into my friend network as much. What I ended up doing was creating a post on Craigslist saying, with a photo of me saying, hi, my name's Jonah. This is who I am. I'm looking for a place. And then a guy answered me there. Yeah. And, you know, it's funny because he was a manifester and I'm a generator. And you might say, wasn't that backwards, Jonah? Like, didn't he respond to you? And weren't you? And it's like, no, I, it's, I put a porch light on. That's what I call it. Yeah. I'm like, I presented myself and I waited for something to happen. And then he initiated. He, he yeah. didn't even post the place. He didn't even have yeah. a place open. He was just like, this dude seems cool. He could live in my house, yeah. you know, and then he contacted me. And then I responded. So, right. I mean, people get really hung up on energy mechanics of oh like, I don't want to initiate. I'm not going to post something on Craigslist. I'm like, that's awareness. I'm sharing the awareness that yeah. I am a person. I'm not making any decision. The decision <laughs> threshold of making a post on Craigslist is like minimal. You know what yeah. I mean? It's like, I'm just yeah. like, I spend like 20 minutes writing up a post about me. It's like, yeah, you know, whatever. Yeah, yeah. So, so that, that's why I, you know, some people about the energy mechanics are like paralyzed. And I'm always like, do yeah. whatever you want. Just don't make decisions from the place of, I got to change something because right. that's where you get into the danger is thinking you, you're trying to change the reality and then you do change it and it does work. But then yeah. two years later, you end up right back where you were and you're kind of like, okay, yeah. good one. Got it. <laughs> you know? <laughs> The mechanics, if I have gotten clients that come to me, it's like, how do I do this correctly? How do, and I'm like, maybe just take a breather and a step back. The, sometimes the more we think about something, the less spaciousness we have to either respond to see what happens. I'm like, just play because there is no wrong decision. Like you, you'll get tired. You'll get burnout. Maybe if yeah, you know, yeah. worse at worse. Yeah, but, you'll know. Like the but program then you'll will come pull back. the plug. Yeah. Right, exactly. And that's <laughs> the thing is, yeah, people aren't so I mean, people get really worried. I always say, like, as a generator, you know, it's like you just missed the bus and you just have to wait to respond, and that's catching the next bus. Yeah. And the next bus might come in an hour, it might come in a day, it might come in a week, it might come in a month. You, you don't know. But you know, yeah. there are there are fallow periods. Uh, projectors, especially, there's they seem to be on a different time frame. So projectors <laughs> definitely like it is like higher stakes in some sense, but also need to not be so worried. Like, okay, if you're a generator, it's somewhat low stakes in the sense that like, you know, I initiated and then something would have happened that I could have responded to. I didn't get a chance to respond. My initiating is just kind of spinning my wheels. Okay, now I just wait to respond to something else. Life is always coming at us yeah. as generators. You know, generators are always here to kind of be pelted and then kind of have to respond to the things <laughs> projectors it's a little bit um they're on a different time frame it's like frustration can happen in a in a moment bitterness takes years and Ooh. like an example of a projector i know he went to new york we, we you know he, he kind of went to my same high school and everything went to new york 15 years later came back to seattle he's in the music industry he was so bitter that he wasn't recognized for his skill and for his talent. And he was so bitter that the music industry is just a sham and a fake and that they're all just friends with each other and they're this and that. He's a two four. So, I mean, I'm sure he had some friends too, but basically he came back so bitter. Well, it's going to take 15 years for him to undo that bitterness. Mm -hmm. Like he spent that whole 15 years trying so hard to make it and failing and like that was accruing the bitterness right. and so like now he's kind of in a place where he's very very bitter and you need to kind of work back towards the other side of it it's not right. overnight you can't just like give him like you give him strategy and authority but he's like oh great so he's got to wait longer like very bitter right. about it you know i i see actually i see so many reddit posts because you know there's so many human design pockets and i'm kind of like 
not too into it, but I read about it and I see sometimes a lot of bitterness or like you didn't do it correctly. It's almost cause and effect. That's how they lead like, oh, well, I did this. So that's why I'm terrible. That's why I'm exhausted. That's why I get no recognition. And then it, it's a very toxic cycle. And I'm like, it's okay. Like bitterness is not terrible as a projector. I'm like, what can we learn from that? How can we come back to ourselves? And it's always one decision at a time, one choice of like, how do I take care of myself? How do I value my energy? How do I orient myself? And that is like little, little choices throughout the day that leads to years that leads to feeling more embodied, but we can't embody yeah. when we have never been there. Well, and it's also realizing that um, people are going to recognize you and love you and invite you and cherish you for who you are, not whether you're bitter or successful. Like with my friend who I'm mentioning is very bitter. I light up when I see him. I'm at a party and he walks in and I like drop everything. And he's my favorite person to see. He's very similar to like a Zach Galifianakis kind of guy. He's so funny. And he will just, he will just like get me cracking up. He'll be like, I mean, even in the bitterness, like I will just be laughing yeah. to tears. So be like, Jonah, I've been trying to date, man. It's really hard. I mean, I put in, a, I put an ad. I said, overweight, alcoholic, seeks woman. I'm not getting any hits. I'm just like, oh my god, I love this guy so much. Like, like he can be like so bitter, but so like so joyful and like deprecating yeah. and self deprecating and just like I don't know. Like I, I'm not bothered by his bitterness. Like that's the thing. It's like I want him to be successful for him. That yeah. is his reward for himself. That is his signature. It's his birthright. It's not mine. Like I, I love the guy, whether he's bitter, whether he's successful, I love him unconditionally. And it's the unconditional invitation and recognition that we have to realize that's the real one. Cause if you're only liking somebody because they're sweet to be around, you don't really like them. You just like the sweetness. Mm -hmm. And if you're like, Oh, you're bitter. I'm not going to be around you. Well, then you probably don't like that person anyway. Like I love this dude, even though he's bitter as hell, I just want him to be successful for him yeah. so that he gets the reward of feeling that yeah, because yeah. it's not like I'm feeling negative about his bitterness. I'm just like, Oh my God, he's hilarious. So, and also many other things and talented and smart. And, and so I recognize so much that he, that he gives the other thing I'll just say just as my projector advice, and I am a generator. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of like type ism in human design, but also it's like, I'm a generator means I belong to the category of generator. I am a damn personality crystal communicating through this bioform. And when this bioform is done, that personality crystal is going to come back in another one. And guess what? This ain't, ain't my first rodeo. This personality crystal has been in a bunch of different bioforms. The crystal doesn't have a type, you know, the personality doesn't have a type. Like, like I am experiencing what it's like to be a generator, but when I'm sharing what I know and my unique outer authority and perspective, I'm not sharing it as a generator. I'm sharing it as a personality crystal like that gets to you know share through gate 12 and different things like that but my, my only point is um there's a lot of like well a generator is not going to be able to tell a projector anything or like well this isn't going to be well you're not here to guide or you're not here i'm like i'm just sharing my outer authority we all we're all personality crystals bopping yeah. around we we're have just these trying to do our own thing <laughs> yeah yeah but but anyway so my my take on projectors as as a generator i guess i have to say as a caveat mm -hmm. um is that one thing I've noticed over the years, and I've got some flack for this, is that there can be a real, a real like self-sabotaging, self-defeating attitude that some projectors have, not a lot, not the ones that work with me, not the ones that are in sort of a growth mindset of how do we learn and engage with life, but some like negative messages, like on Reddit, for instance, or on the Human Design and Astrology Facebook, that's like, you get a lot of people like, I don't know. It's just, it's a big one. I think the bigger the group is, the more you're going to have the whole range of human condition and you're going to get everything from very fixed mindset, limiting beliefs, all the way to growth mindset yeah. beliefs that help people grow and flourish. And what I like to do is try to get rid of those fixed mindset beliefs. And one of them is that being available is only for generators. Yes. Being sacrally available is for generators. Yes. Being available to respond. Like I'm available to text me anytime. I'm available to email back anytime. I'm available to call anytime. I'm not saying projectors should do that. That takes a lot of work. Like you guys aren't here to just like be on call. So not that, but there's another sense of availability of making yourself available 
in an efficient way. And one of the complaints I've heard is, well, projectors don't have energy to be available. It uses so much energy. I'm like, why does it use so much energy then? You're here to master the systems. You're here to be efficient. You're here to be smart about how you use your energy. You can be available in a way that's like maximizing your availability and minimizing your energy cost. And so I don't know that he's a projector, but I'll just give one example. There's a man named Brad Feld who founded the, he started the Founders Co-op in Boulder, Colorado. And he wrote a book on building communities and it was how to build a tech community. He wanted to make Boulder into kind of a tech place. And what he did, he said, it takes 30 years, but it only takes one day a month. And this is such a projector kind of idea. And he, he spent one day a month going to a cafe where you could book 20 minute sessions with him and he would talk to any entrepreneur for free and give his entrepreneurial advice and sit at the cafe and just connect with people. And he just did this and it really created this entrepreneurial community. And it was like so efficient. Like he didn't, he wasn't there every day. He wasn't there day in, day out. He wasn't always available. He was making himself available. And I, I guess all I'm trying to say is that we need projectors like as a generator like we, you know there's way more generators than projectors and we, we talk to each other about what to do and we have like no idea what to do we're like these like ships going around in circles we need a damn just lighthouse. bouncing like, off like, of yeah, each we're, other like, bumping into each other and we're like ending up at the same place we're like i thought i was going a different direction like how did i end up here again you know we need the lighthouse to like show us the way and a lot of times we don't know where to find it and we don't know how to get it and so what i'm saying for projectors is like, yes, you're absolutely right. Do not make yourself overly available to respond, but do make sure that you have a sort of billboard or that you have a sort of, make sure you're on the scene in some way. Like there was a great quote from Thelonious Monk, the great jazz pianist. Monk's one of the most brilliant jazz players of all time, jazz composer, pianist, and he was a projector. And he said, never sound for a gig, never sound your horn for a gig, just be on the scene. And sounding your horn for the gig is like, hey, will you hire me? Hey, will you bring me in? Hey, will you, you know, that's not going to work. That annoys people. But being on the scene and then, you know, I've heard projectors say, well, easy for you to say, Jonah, it takes a lot of energy to be on the scene. I'm like, does it? Why does it? Maybe you can find a way to be on the scene that doesn't take much energy at all. Maybe you can find a way to sort of have your billboard or have your presence integrated into what people are doing as a reminder for them that they can invite you and even pay you to help them because they need the help. So it's kind of like finding a way to you know, be a part of things like at HDHD, we have this finding a way to be a part of HDHD. That's not totally exhausting for the projector, yeah. but that they're still sort of on the scene. So people know they exist because the biggest problem for the projector is oftentimes they're waiting for the invitation, but nobody knows what they can do and nobody knows. Yeah. Right. It's almost yeah. like they, they, like there's two parts to it. It's like putting yourself out there in some way that's correct for you. It might not be, you know, to a large group, but at least like making yourself on the scene of some group yeah. and then being a part of that and then being invited because people show up. An example here in Santa Fe is we have a weekly um, a event that's free and it's for, you know, human design folks and being a projector here. It's like, all you really have to do is kind of be part of the community. And then somebody comes in and says, oh, I want a reading. Like I just referred a reading yeah. to a projector last week. She's part of the scene. It's not like she shows up every week, but yeah. we all kind of know her. And then um, someone was kind of wanting to get into human design. And I was like, oh, you should get a reading from, from her. She's great. And we contacted, made the contact and she got a reading. So it's yeah. like, be available for people to to at least get a hold of you that's all i'm trying to say like there's this little nuance there yeah, i, I love yeah. your, your oh, take on it too. i appreciate it so much because like to add on to that i think being seen is important and also checking in with your capacity because so many projectors me included before i learned about human design we spent so much time overextended like we are either burnt out depleted so to want to think about the invitations or the right invitations is exhausting so mm -hmm. like checking with the capacity, do you just need some rest right now? Do you need time off right now? Like put yourself in a space where you can uh, like excel. If you're not in a space where you feel like you can excel, it doesn't matter what invitations come. You're going to be so aggravated and anxious about everything. But if you can regulate, let's use that word, regulate yourself, see what is your capacity, like you said, and then be like, okay, 
what feels fun to me? Where can I put myself in a way that it's fun? Because yes, we are projectors, but we also have the ability, like every other type, to pick up energies from others. Like, you know, and sometimes these energies can be so healthy if we know how to take in and release it. And I mean, a big part of my talk is talking about these all our open centers and shadows. Like we're here to really take in and be resilient. But to build that resilience is not mental. We can't think our way into our resilience. So thank you for sharing that about projectors that, like, yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Well, and also that, I mean, there is a sort of leap of faith when you leave behind all of the energy drains. There's a mm -hmm. woman named Jen Sincero. She writes the badass series of yeah. books. I happen to know her. She lives here in Santa Fe. I've, we, you know, we chat human design sometimes. And I yeah. see her at parties and things and she's part of the scene here, you know, yeah. and uh, she's a projector and she told me some of her story and essentially she left behind a whole life to the point where she was like living in a van and just being like very like punk rock DIY about like, she didn't do this because of human design, but people arrive at it through different avenues. And I also yeah. think by the way that sometimes there are these limiting beliefs in the human design community that nobody who's, who's gone a different path has a valid yeah. contribution. And I'm like, obviously not like human design itself is a synthesis of all these mystical traditions. Like how can we yeah. be so closed minded? Like people, people happen across this stuff all the time. Plus, if you really do believe that these are the mechanics of the Maya, they're the mechanics of the Maya for everyone, whether or not they've heard of human design. So yes. people discover these fundamental mechanics and what she discovered for herself as a projector, kudos to her was that she was burned out and miserable and not making it in a generator driven wage slave kind of world and she basically just left behind that life and then began writing knowing that she had something that she had to get out there in the world yeah. and then it was just kind of magical i mean her books took off and became bestsellers and now they're at airports and yeah i, mean, I think i have a really... book here yeah it's one of yeah, the yeah she's really cool i mean I should invite her to HDHD this year. Oh gosh, Seriously, I, I will shoot her a text. Like she knows, she knows human design and she's always kind of like curious and fun about it. Like yeah. we had, um, yeah, we have mutual friends. And so I'll see her at like Krampus parties and different, like different mm -hmm. events that, that we, we have. We have some, I mean, it's a very small community here. So she's definitely a part of the community. She'd probably appreciate the invitation, honestly, because I sometimes don't even really think to invite, um, you know, I can be really bad about that, but, but yeah, I mean, I, I would love to see her and, uh, it would be so cool to have her involved and just as a projector who kind of naturally arrived at her own yes. realization that, and she's not bitter at all anymore. I mean, she's wildly successful, but I think she yeah. got to that point of bitterness where she's like, something has to break, yes. something has to change, but instead of trying to initiate some new thing she just kind of allowed her old life to fall away even to the point of living in a van like that takes yeah. a lot of courage like that's scary to yeah. be at that point where you're just kind of like well i guess this is my life now i guess this is what it is like you just kind of go yeah. into that well, one other thing i'll say is that um a lot of people in human design communities are very very negative about the term manifestation or yes. manifestation culture and i think that they really misunderstand because when i've I'm not so familiar with this, but like the secret or any of these manifestation yeah. things, as far as I understand it, they seem to mostly be for generators. And also, as far as I understand it, they seem to not really be telling generators to try to initiate and go get their life. They seem to be saying, make room in your life, which is absolutely real, 100% yeah. real. And they seem to be get clear on what is actually important to you and your purpose yeah. and like raise your awareness, like become aware. And like, those are both really important things to do. Like, what do we do studying human design if we're not becoming aware of things? Yeah. And what am I doing as a generator, if not making room in my life so that I actually can respond or a projector making room in your life so you can be invited and can be recognized a manifester making room in their life so they can have the solitude to go into their cave of solitude and yeah. come up with the next big thing, or even a reflector making the room so they're not beholden to constantly having to make split second decisions, like making the spaciousness so that they can slow down and allow yeah. things more time. So, you know, I'm not, I won't like read this literature. I'm not a part of that culture, but I yeah. often see, you know, a sort of, um, schism in people in human design that are kind of like anti-manifestation. And yeah. to me, I think it's yes. On the one hand, trying to just make your life happen, you end up in the same place because you didn't wait long enough to see where it was going. Right. But 
that's not what I hear from manifestation literature. They're, they're not like, just go out there and make it happen. Go out there and force life to do it. They're more like, get clear on what you want, make a vision board, like get in touch with like your dreams uh, for life, your visions. I mean, not, not just your dreams, although that probably helps too, um, you know, and make room in your life for things. Like if you want to have a partner and you don't have, it's like feng shui, like you want to have a partner, but you only have one side table, right. make the physical <laughs> space for another partner. Like yeah. that is how, that is a law of the Maya. I mean, that is a fundamental law of the Maya, the same Maya that we study in human design. It's like, yeah. it has built in laws, seven year cycles, yeah. nature abhors a vacuum make room for something and it will appear if you build it they will come like these are yeah. all like laws of the maya so yeah yeah oh. I, i'm not such a negative person about these things i know i i'm loving these hot takes because i think one of the reasons for me and i was so afraid of so many human design communities was because i just from online i witnessed these i'm like i don't know like you know the way i share is very more like human design is one door of so many other doors. Some people find themselves and live in alignment without ever reading about human design. Rock climbing, that might be the thing that just helps them like connect to themselves, right? So for me, it's yeah, always Rod been like- Yeah, didn't learn about human design. You know what I mean? <laughs> right, he, like, right. he, he didn't. He didn't He didn't have somebody come to him and say like, do this. He just, you know, was doing it and just right. living it. It's like, you know, yeah. don't take it too seriously. It's not too mental. It's almost like we know what we want. As a kid, we would reach for what we wanted, right? Like if we knew mm -hmm. how to live then, then now as an adult with that awareness, it shouldn't be heavy. How can it be- supportive so i'm so grateful for this conversation and the community that you you've created in santa fe Thank you. can you talk Thank a little you. bit more about this and like how what was your idea about the first conference and getting people together yeah yeah and i well yeah i can definitely go into the conference and i guess one other thing i would just say really quick also is that one of the laws of the maya it's actually really perfectly um, summarized by a very short parable that was Carl Jung's favorite parable, sort of the parable of the underground stream. And uh, for, for Jung, the way he tells it normally, I mean, it's very short, is there are life-giving waters, these waters of life that spring up, and the people gather around and are nourished by them. And then over time, they start to make their own rituals around them and they start to make their own customs. And this is like the individual going into the tribal, going into the collective even. Over time, the water dries up, but nobody notices because they're so wrapped up in the rituals and they're so wrapped up in everything that's been created around it. So they just keep it going and they just don't even notice. And then the water comes up somewhere else and it starts over again. And Jung loved this because this was really showing how the life force is always moving in that there's life in a different movement at a different time. There's life in a different area of the evolution of human consciousness at a different time. Like we are co-creators of human evolution and we are here to take part in that evolutionary process. And actually, by the way, this is just as a side note, if there's any four ones out there, four ones always ask me to explain because it's so confusing to them how it works, right? Yeah. Um, if you're a right angle, you know that it's like personal destiny and you're here to kind of if you're right angle, I always say like, don't help the right angle too much because you're robbing them from the ability of figuring it out themselves. Mm -hmm. Left angle is kind of here to help. I mean, in certain ways and here to be karmic. And obviously we, we are here to help. I'm not saying don't help, but you know, we're here to kind of be the administrators and be the sort of, um, you know, behind the scenes people. But then the, the four ones, the juxtaposition, people are always like, what are they here to do? Like, I'm a four one, what am I here to do? And I always say that their purpose is not fulfilled through personal destiny nor through karma right? It's, it's different. Their purpose is fulfilled through being involved with what is going on in the zeitgeist, in the actual spirit of the time. So if you're a 4-1 in the mid 60s, you better have been involved in civil rights or women's rights, you know, or anti-war protesting. Like that's what, where you were needed. Like those areas needed you. If you were a 4-1, you know, in like 2015, like trans rights, people needed you to be a part of that. Like now you need to be involved in like, not just political, but any sort of collective issue that is like, now it's probably like women's rights more than ever after overturning Roe versus Wade in the US. Like 4-1s are needed on the front lines of, and you know, in these positions in the sort of hot button, hot topic issues of the time. Like their purpose is fulfilled through their involvement with what is going on in the collective mm -hmm. at the time. So just a little point there, but but yeah, I mean, to get back to this whole idea of like, what is hot changes because the underground stream moves and the mm -hmm. old water dries up and new water appears. And even someone like Jung, Jung's work was so 
important for me. And yet now, because we're multiple generations in, some of that water has dried up. There's still some life-giving water in the Jungian communities. But as an example, um, Ra's friend, uh, Jürgen, brought, brought um, human design to Jungian communities in Zurich in the 1990s and early 90s, and they laughed him out of the Zurich Institute. So that's just an example. Like Jung himself would have been fascinated to hear this knowledge, but only a couple generations later, enough of the water had run dry that there wasn't enough life force energy there to actually be vital and interested in the material. So, I mean, that's one, one little, and then, and then I'll talk about how HDHD emerged, but I guess like one little side point of just, that's kind of what we're doing by following strategy and authority is seeing where life takes us and where there is life. And that's like what I was doing when I came to Santa Fe, I was like, there's not life everywhere in Santa Fe. In fact, a lot of the world is just kind of old and and dusty and and just kind of there's not a lot of life left in it you go into these places and you feel some of these institutions for instance can feel so sterile and so lifeless and or some of these office buildings where people are just sitting there and in, 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 in jobs and so on and so i guess that that's my only real point is that part of what human design does is it brings us to where life needs us now which is different from where it needed us before now this is a nice segue into the hdhd conference People have asked me, Jonah, you're a generator. How did you start a conference? Isn't that initiating, it's right? Okay. <laughs> um, well, you know, it's interesting, right? It's like, how do you start something as a generator? One thing I will say is that if you have a fifth or sixth line personality, so the five one, five two, six two, and six three, um, that personality role itself is, in its own way, a role of initiating. This is something Steve Rhodes says, and I think gets he gets flack from people because they're like, well, if you're a generator, you're never here to initiate. Yes, mechanically. And this is why there's a little disconnect. Ra actually came up with a very interesting um, approach where he looked at the 48 combinations. He didn't include manifesting generators, but he grouped together generators and manifesting generators, reflectors, projectors, manifestors with each of the profiles. So 12 profiles, four fundamental types, and he looked at the 48 possible combinations. In his case, he was a fifth line personality and he was a manifester. So his role, the profile is kind of the role we play, was to initiate. He also had the life force mechanical energy to initiate and to have a big impact through the throat and through his motorized throat and kind of knowing how to impact through words, but also through actions, knowing what actions to take at the right time to maximize his impact. I don't have that. I don't have the ability to consistently take actions that will maximize my impact in the world. I'm not here to have big impact in the world in that way. I do temporarily, you know, get my, my 12 gets lit up or I also have gate 45 in the throat. It's like I temporarily have the ability to do, to, to uh, express. And those are primary action gates. Uh, four of the, the throat gates are primary action gates and the rest are more for informing. So I do have some ability to kind of impact and have action temporarily, but that's not really the way that I operate. And yet I have a fifth line role and my fifth line role is to start things. So how do you reconcile this? Well, there, there's a big lag time. I can know that part of my role or have discovered that part of my role is to, to do something, but not be able to do it until all the pieces line up and it might take years for them to line up. The other side of it is, if you're a manifester, you don't build it hoping it comes, you sell it and then get people to build it. Mm -hmm. It's a very different approach, right? In fact, we always get that advice, like sell it first and then build it. That's not really how generators work, you know? Generators build, we're here to build. And when we, as a generator, when a generator gets so focused on the end result, we don't realize that there is no end, that end mm -hmm. result is an imaginary concept that you can only really wait for two things. You can wait for some imaginary future time that will never come, in which case you're not waiting to respond. You're just in some sort of mental stasis, or you can wait to respond, in which case you're engaged with life every single day. So the way that I say that the conference was built was brick by brick, and I didn't know if anyone would show up mm. because I knew that in creating something, I felt satisfied. That is all my awareness brought me is like, 
Every time, Jonah, that you've tried to make something happen a certain way, it hasn't worked. Every time you've created, whether it's writing a song or anything, it feels great, right? And all creativity begins with ideas. I love the French philosopher Gilles Deleuze because he said, an idea is always connected to its medium. You have a podcast idea, you have a tweet idea or an Instagram post idea, you have an idea for a lecture, you have an idea for a sentence, an idea for a paragraph, an idea for a chapter. You have an idea for any creative production and whether that idea can come into fruition or not, it depends. Like even philosophers, they have ideas for concepts, which I know is funny because we use the terms interchangeably, but they're like, I wonder if this concept would work. And then they spend the next five years of their life developing the concept, you know, that's how it was. I had an idea, like, I wonder if we could actually just have a conference here. Like that's yeah. an idea, right? right? The same way I might be like, I wonder if this chord would fit with that chord on the piano. Like, I wonder yeah. if I could make a song about this. Like, it's yeah. not really that different. It's just a creative idea. And then you get to discover if that idea can live. Yes. You get to discover if that idea actually can emerge. Right. It's almost like, you know, sometimes I summon as like, follow the energy. Sometimes the energy is going to be built up and you, you will be focused on something. And then you might feel like it's a pause. You step back until somebody comes along the way and ignites that again. And it catalyzes it again. Exactly. exactly. Right. There's a lot of pauses. As a yeah. generator, there's a lot of pauses. I can't just go into my chamber of silence like a manifester and spend three furious days <laughs> envisioning the future and then bringing it fully formed into the world. Yeah. I'm not bringing things fully formed into the world. I yeah. did a lot of tech, tech entrepreneurship and one of the best bits of advice I got was if you launch your product and you're not embarrassed by it not being ready, you waited too long. And I mm -hmm. love that as a generator because we're kind of meant to build brick by brick and, you know projector might be a little different i mean or i guess you work with generators and you might but still even a projector is working with the navigational process manifestors have this amazing ability to kind of go into their creative zone and spend like three days and come up with like some small but permanently life-changing thing that they've just like kind of given birth to into the world and it's kind of fully formed like that's what's amazing about the manifesto like i'm not saying like rod didn't change and develop human design but each thing he released was sort of fully formed when it came out right. which was just like such an amazing thing to me as a generator i'm i'm not releasing fully formed things into the world i'm building it brick by brick and i'm very much like having to find satisfaction in the process and in the journey, because if I delay that satisfaction, I will never have the energy to continue. So it's literally one of these kind of catch 22 things where it's like, I don't know if catch 22 is the right word. It's just like one of these nuances of being a generator where yes, I have a role to play in starting something, but how do I start it by building it in a way that's personally satisfying and approaching everything as a creation. So mm -hmm. it's not like, I have this boring task of doing the schedule. It's like, no, this schedule is my sonata. This schedule is my concerto. You know, this schedule is my creative act. In 2022, someone else did the schedule. Great job. But I ended up feeling almost like, ah, I didn't get the satisfaction of like having, I didn't get to create it. It's almost like they did the song that year. And yeah. I created other things that year. You know, I made some right. t-shirts or I made some other part of it. But it's kind of like realizing that you know, everything is a creative act. Like, yeah, you write the songs, that's a creative act, but then you choose what order they go in on the album, that's also a creative act. Yeah. And it's also just as satisfying. Writing the song is satisfying, but putting the order is also satisfying. And then doing the packaging is also satisfying. So it's realizing that every step of the process, you have an idea, an idea, really who knows where it comes from you can say it's mental but is it really it's almost like spiritual it can be an emotional idea it could be a physical yeah. idea i mean it it just comes from somewhere the idea appears and then you kind of go i wonder if that would work would people come to santa fe would they even mm -hmm. come to a conference turns out they would oh. but you know you get to discover that through the development of the idea step by step and so that first year we had 75 people and it was mind blowing to me. I mean, it was basically like the only thing I knew after the first year of conferences, we're doing this again. That was like mm -hmm. the only thing I knew. I didn't know what it would look like. I didn't know what it, how it changed. I didn't know if we would need to get a different venue. That's I was just like, we're doing this again. Like there's no way we're not doing this again. Yeah. And uh, it just, it just kept going. We're in the fourth year now. And, um, you know, it just kept growing from there. And as it, as it develops, I mean, it is, it's just staying, staying true to the realization that, for me anyway, I mean, there's two sides of it. I have a role to play 
and I have the energy. And the energy will only work in response and only if it's satisfying. And the role to play is similar to the role Ra played in any fifth line, actually any sixth line for that matter plays, which is being in the left angle and sort of contributing something to the collective. Fifth and sixth lines are a little more collective and sort of, you know, playing the collective role. My collective role is the general. Um, sixth line collective role is the administrator, right? And that's just kind of part of it though, is to be in this role for the world and then to have the energy to back it up. And those are the two sides of it. Oh, the energy to back it up. I think if we can sum it up. It's like, whatever decision we make, check in with the energy. Energy doesn't lie. Our mind will be like, it's a great idea. It's a good place for connections and all that. But then the energy, if we can be in our bodies, sometimes it tells us like, do we actually have capacity? Do we need more information? Something's off about this. What do we tweak? Like there's so much data everywhere. And oh, I can probably ask you so many questions because I'm like, Delay satisfaction. Maybe this can be another topic, but I'll I'll ask you that later, unless you want to share as a generator. No, no. I mean, I just have one little comment on the energy, which is that I'm a big fan of the work of Steve Rhodes. He's a bit of a controversial figure. He studied with Ra and then kind of went off making his own interpretations that he calls Bantu, which is in reference to the original um, human design sort of idea of the cosmology that uh, the Bon and the two were the names for the sort of yin and yang crystals of consciousness. Mm -hmm. So the voice actually gave the names, the true names of what we call yin and yang, which are sort of a translation from some, who knows what, some, some you know, ancient tongue or celestial tongue, which is Bon and Tu. And uh, it, is, it is interesting that the two is the second and that we still say two as a word. But, um, but anyway, um, for, for Steve Rhodes and his Bon Tu system, he really talks a lot about the energy of the centers as the energy to do a certain kind of activity and what you have energy for, like you're looking at an energy map of what you consistently have energy for. And he basically says, we all have energy to do everything at different times. We're lit up in different ways, but the program will pull the plug. This is the term. And I, I used this term earlier. The program will pull the plug eventually if you don't have it at a defined center, because you know, even if you have Neptune or Pluto transiting, well, that might be a couple of years, but eventually it's gonna pull the plug and you're not gonna have that energy. And you've experienced that as a projector, eventually that sacral has its plug pulled and you know what the plug pulling feels like. It feels like you no longer have the energy to do that. You're getting that burnout and so on. So, uh, but he, he gives really nice keynotes to the, um, to the centers, I don't know if he's base four, but I wouldn't be surprised if he is because he kind of came, gave up, he came up with all his own words for things, right? And uh, and so that's a nice reminder for me. I only have three centers to find. I have the root, the sacral, and the G center. The root, he gives the keynote of endurance, and by endurance he means uh, the ability to fail and try again. And so he says to find root people, they're really built to fail and try again, and fail and try again, fail and try again. If you don't have a defined root. It's actually maybe a comfort to know that if you try something and it doesn't, doesn't work, try something else. You're not here to keep trying. You know, you're, you're not here to just keep hitting your head on the wall trying to make it work. I am, I am. But I don't have a defined spleen or solar plexus, so I'm not trying to- you have a completely open solar plexus. Right, right, completely undefined. Yeah, so I'm really not trying to do that. So, so what am I trying again and again? What is my root trying? It's not trying to succeed in the material plane. It's not trying to feel good or to work out the emotions or fueling the emotional process or the experiential process of the solar plexus. All it's really doing is connected to the sacral. And he gives what I love as a beautiful keynote for the sacral, service that the sacral is here to serve. We're the ones here to serve. You guide us to, to help us serve better. So you give us the service of how you guide us, but it's a little bit different. You're not really, projectors aren't really here to be beholden to the generator serving us. You're not here to serve, to wait on us hand and foot. We're here to wait on you hand and foot, right? That, that's what the generator is here to actually do is to serve. And of course they're here to serve different things when it, you know, 659 connects to the solar plexus, they're here to serve emotions and feeling and over to the spleen, they're here to serve the material to the throat, here to serve, um, you know, sharing in the world and things like that. But what I'm here to do is to, to basically struggle from the root and endure and persevere and continue trying and failing and trying again to find the best way to serve. Mm -hmm. Like, that's what HDHD is, is a service. And if we fail, I'm not here to give up and be like, well, that didn't work, try something else. I'm here to be like, okay, okay, try again. 
try that's again. such okay, your 46 your 46 29 that's basically like throughout you're like you know i committed to the job i'm gonna stay there until it was time like, yeah i'm here you to serve well, and, exactly and also ultimately what am i here to serve what is the g center well steve rhodes gives a very beautiful high level keynote which is love so i'm ultimately here to serve love um, the, the transpersonal love gates are on the G center. You could also give the keynote direction, I guess I'm here to serve the direction of things. So the direction of human design into the future, the love of human design and serve people who share in my love of human design. Yeah. And I'm here to keep trying again and again to find the best way to serve. Yeah. So if I try one way and it doesn't work, I'm here to try another way. Yeah. And just to, so that's kind of what I came equipped with in this life. Mm. It's not who I am. I mean, it is in some sense. But, you know, maybe last life I didn't have those centers. Maybe next life I won't have them. But in this life, what I came equipped with to fulfill my purpose is the ability to persevere and endure in serving love. And that's basically who I am in this in this lifetime. And I, I like to remind people, you know, in some weird divine synchronistic way, you have everything you need in life. Now, I don't mean that in some toxic positivity bypassing, spiritual bypassing of like, someone who's starving and you're like, you have everything you need. Like, I don't mean it literally. I just mean they've come equipped with the energetic centers yeah. that they needed to fulfill their purpose in this life. And part of the self love is accepting. I don't need a defined throat. I don't need a defined ego. I, I can have a completely open solar plexus. That's fine. I didn't need it for this life. It would have pulled me into a different area. All I really need to fulfill my purpose is what I came equipped with. Mm -hmm. And I think it's a real relief when you actually know that at a deep level. That was beautiful. Yes. Thank you, Joe, enough for sharing your sacred joy, your determination, you. and also permission for people to embrace more of where they're being guided towards, because it might not make sense for everybody, but we all have a different role to play. We all have different things that we want to experience and we have exactly what we need. Anything else you would like to share about what? Yeah. HG, I, I think that's a great HG place to or wrap anything it up. Else. I'll just say, <laughs> yeah, I guess I'll just say, I think that's a great place to wrap it up. Um, you know, HDHD, someone asked me, how long do you plan to do HDHD for? Oh, I had no answer because it was so, could, I had just assumed it would be forever. I mean, I'm a gate 45. They say that when the 45 rises to a tribal leadership role, you have to kill them to replace them. So, I mean, I was kind of like, how long will I be doing HDHD? As long as I can. That's such I an mean, interesting um, question. <laughs> yeah, such a, I was kind of like, how many years are you going to do it for? Uh, it was a manifester who asked me. This is how manifestors think, you know. They're kind of like, you know, you've initiated something, you've started it, aren't you done? I'm like, no, I'm a generator. I'm here to like be the person to respond to. And then people also ask me, they're like, Jonah, don't you get bothered getting emails, getting texts from people? You make yourself so available. I'm like, I'm a generator, okay? Like, if I'm not responding, something's wrong. Like, I tell everybody in all the emails, if you have any questions at all, shoot me a message and it's like people ask me like hey is this a good restaurant i'm like yeah try that one you know like i don't know like it doesn't bother me like i'm here to respond like it's, yeah. there's, there's kind of like nothing is beneath the the generator if we really take it seriously that the generator is here to serve then how can i best serve i can tell you what restaurant i think is good i can tell you if i think it's a good b and b like that's not beneath me i'm not like putting myself up in some like oh no no don't bother me i'm busy in my chamber of silence like communing with the heavens that's the manifester you know oh and i love manifestors and we need them for that like don't bother the manifester but do bother the generator we we're, we're here to be bothered that's our thing so. <laughs> yes not, as a, long not as a bad you way set, but you know you set your limits you set your limits of when and all that because it's about knowing yourself because you enjoy this work it yeah. doesn't become bothersome for you well right and I, I set my limits in the sense that like I will just not respond if I can't and mm -hmm. And so, you know, if I don't respond, then that's fine. But like, I don't set the limits in advance. I set the yeah. limit through uh -huh, uh -huh, in each moment. I negotiate the boundary continually yes. and there's no real, like, you know, I'm kind of just like, oh yeah, message me. And then if yeah. I'm just like, uh, I don't have time for this, then it's uh-uh. But you know, I have gate 29, the gate of saying yes. Mostly yeah. it's uh-huh. Like, unless it's like um, something really outside of, you know, I, and that's the thing. I don't even know what I'm going to respond to. Like, it yeah. might be something Nobody totally weird. Like someone, <laughs> someone might be like, you should check out this movie. And I'll be like, uh-huh, that movie looks awesome. And then I'll just go watch that movie. Like, it doesn't, I don't know what I'm going to respond to until it happens. And yeah. I think that's part of, part of the mystery of, of the, of the generator is sort of the mystery of life, that life brings us things and we don't always, 
know in advance. But but yeah, I would just say, I guess, as a kind of a final message, um, you know, for anyone considering coming to HDHD, check it out. Uh, you can get more information on it. Um, I'm, I'm trying to, one of the things I have not been good at is documenting. So this year we have a lot of documenting going on. We have volunteers who are like taking videos and interviewing people and stuff like that. And so hopefully we'll be able to kind of put that up on a website eventually some someday and people will kind of get a feeling for what it is. But, you know, it's a really amazing time. Uh, I really love that. The other thing I would say is just that I teach a lot of classes, not just on human design. It's mostly human design, but also personality typology and other interesting things. And so if anybody likes taking classes, you can check that out. And um, besides that, you know, a big conference isn't for everyone because we did have 150 people last year. We're probably on track for that this year. We also just have smaller events, um, retreats. We have something called the Winter Respite. We have the High Desert Human Design Spring Fling. Those are usually like max 25 people. Not that we set the limit, but that's just how many people come. And um, they, they're either free in some cases, or we've also done like a paid retreat with classes and learning. The free ones are more just like a chance to hang out and get to know each other. And then the paid ones are more focused. So yeah, I mean, everybody is kind of, you know, has to know their own, follow their own strategy and authority for like, are you brought to this large group event or maybe you're brought to a smaller event or maybe you just are afraid of crowds and that's totally fine. Although I will say this is a very, very special crowd and I would urge anyone who doesn't like big crowds to see if that's true after coming to HDHD. Mm -hmm. The, the, the crowd like feels it. pretty good here, I had to say. It's a good vibe. It's a good vibe. Oh, I'll share all the relevant links and information so you guys can find out about it. And thank you so much, Shona, for joining me today. Uh, thank you for having me. It was such a, such a great conversation. Thank you so much for listening to the Whole and Unleashed podcast. If you're feeling pulled to get into action and want to connect women, check out the Align and Embody journal on wholeandunleashed.com. You'll also find resources on mindset, human design, and archive for past episodes of this podcast. And if you enjoyed this episode, please share, leave a comment or review on iTunes and Spotify. Thank you so much for tuning in and have a wonderful day wherever you are.